The Teachers Guild of New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this event. We pay our respects to elders past, present of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters throughout Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mr. Patrick Nam. As the Vice President of the Teachers Guild of New South Wales, I would like to thank you for joining us for our Guild Education Series on the topic today, Enhancing Teacher Wellbeing. It is my great pleasure to be joined by our distinguished panel to discuss this important education topic more broadly. Our panel this evening includes Daniela Falecki, Education Specialist and Founder of Teacher Wellbeing, Amy Green, Founder of The Wellness Strategy, Matthew Williston, Director of Staffing and Administration at Bridgetine College, Randwick and the Teachers Guild of New South Wales Councillor, Leanne Nicol, Specialist, School Leadership and Development from Sydney Catholic Schools and Accredited Growth Coach, and Megan Bennett, PhD candidate and Director of Operations, Leppington Anglican College and the Teachers Guild of New South Wales Councillor who will be moderating this event. Thank you for our panel for joining us today. Just for some housekeeping, please feel free to share your experiences, thoughts and questions in the chat function and pose any questions to the panel through the Q&A box on the Zoom control panel. Please keep your Q&A questions short and relevant to the topic on what we are talking about today. Our host, Megan Bennett, and myself will be monitoring this in the background, and me Megan Bennett will be moderating and will tend to ask questions during our discussion panel. Thank you, Daniela, Amy, Matthew, Leanne, and Megan, over to you. All right, thank you and good evening everyone and welcome to our first Zoom into Education uh, series event for the year on this important topic of teacher wellbeing. I'd like to extend Patrick's welcome to our wonderful panellists, Daniela, Amy, Matthew and Leanne. Uh, to begin and by way of introduction, I'd like to invite the panellists to share with us about their professional journeys, uh, what their current role is and the importance of wellbeing within their current role. We'll start with Daniela, followed by Amy, Matthew and Leanne. If you could just unmute, thank you. Oh, you would th you would think I was a beginner in the space, wouldn't you? But you know, I would like to remind everybody because you've forgotten that it's week eleven of term. In case anyone happened to forget, um, but I uh, my name is Daniela Falecki, and I'm the founder of Teach Wellbeing. As Megan, um, you already said, but thank you for being on this uh, panel with us here today. Those of you that are watching. Um, I was a tired, exhausted teacher uh, tw for basically 20 years. Um, I gave my best. I did my best. I started uh, in Western Sydney. I taught in the government system. Um, I became a little bit cynical, jaded, and um, I blamed myself for not working hard enough. And basically, my resources were completely depleted. And so I felt I had no other choice but to leave teaching. I embarked on my own particular journey to find better ways and I found research in positive psychology, social and emotional learning, coaching psychology, and psychological health and safety. And in that space, have done a lot of different things, which you're welcome to go to my website and read all about when you've got a spare 30 seconds. Um, and But now what I do, I have the privilege of working with incredible educators around Australia. And in fact, last month I was in Hong Kong and next month in Singapore, hearing stories and supporting um, staff in the wellbeing helping them be their best selves, helping them build their resources from the inside and from the outside, and also working with our phenomenal middle leadership teams to build their capacity so they can then support our young people, which is why we're there in the first place. So it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll hand over to Amy. Thanks, Daniela, and thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here and being able to talk about this important topic, that is teacher wellbeing. Um, my journey... In this space really started about 10 years ago. I had taught here in Australia, but also over in the UK. And I came back and noticed, I went, I went back to the same school and I came back and noticed that a lot of my colleagues and people that I had worked with in the past were a little bit more tired. The workload seemed to be higher. They were a bit more stressed. And I was at that point in my career where I was deciding, um, what do I, what do I want to do now? Where do I want to go next? Do I want to step into this leadership path or do I want to um, set my sights on being a principal? Where do I want to go? And so 
what spoke to me was this idea of being able to really help our educators in a different way. I wanted to help them build their practice and be great teachers, but I also wanted to help them know that it was okay to have a life outside of the classroom. We didn't have to burn ourselves to the end, absolutely. Um, and so that led me to do similar to what, sorry, just chuck this cat down, um, similar to what uh, Daniela talked about, lots of study in regards to human behaviour and understanding how people work, positive psychology, whilst also taking up various roles in a school environment. So I did go down the path of leadership and I did work in different schools, state schools, public schools, independent schools. And through trying to do too many things all at once, wanting to be the great leader, wanting to be the great teacher, and also wanting to help all of the educators, I went through this chronic stress journey myself. And that really was, uh, in a way, hard for me to recognise, hard for me to actually honour, hard for me to even be able to speak about. And I really didn't know all of the intricacies of that until I wrote my book, until I was able to reflect on that. And what I learned similarly to what Daniela shared was that I played such a significant role in my own well-being, but I was in a space of blaming others. You know, it was the system's fault. It was my colleague's fault. It was leaders, but it wasn't. There were so many other pieces to the puzzle. And that led me to do what I do now, which is working in the wellness strategy. And I do various things, but a lot of what my work centers around is how do we design schools as workplaces to function really well that so that staff can feel well and work well, so that classrooms operate in a great way? And how do we support leaders to be able to support their staff through stress periods, through identifying where uh, stress intensities might happen when we're talking about things like workload? And how do we redesign some of our systems, our structures, our processes, the things that we've done because we've always done them in a way to be more efficient and more proactive and supportive for our staff? because let's be honest, some of the things that we might be doing in schools are a little bit outdated or they're not up to date with certain literature. And so it's about really uh, being more, more proactive and more solutions focused in this space that we know is really huge, but deserves a lot of attention. Leanne, I think you're next. Uh, me or Matt? Do you want to go, Matthew? Over to you, Leanne. I'll go last. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and first of all, thank you. I really acknowledge the time that you've taken. Um, Daniela acknowledged that it was week at week 11, so taking the time to uh, attend this session, I just really want to acknowledge you for doing that and uh, your commitment to your professionalism, but more especially uh, your commitment to yourself in doing so. Um, so I've... Um, been working for 43 years um, as certainly as a teacher <clears throat> and for the, about the last 35 of those I've, I've been in leadership roles or roles where I've been able to uh, work with teachers and now some of our senior leaders about balancing the demands that come with work and life and family and uh, and uh, and their own health so that then they're able to have the sort of satisfaction that they're seeking, the satisfaction for themselves, um, for their relationships and, and for their work experiences. You know, in a sense, what I like to say is live the life that they, they want to live, you know, that they dream, and that's a little bit different for all of us. Um, just by way of a bit of formality, I've worked in four different Catholic dioceses um, two states. I've worked in the independent sector. I've worked across sectorally and internationally. Um, I'm a former school principal and a currently a school leadership and improvement specialist and um, an accredited advanced coach. So I'm very interested in well-being because I have a deep belief that we teach who we are as human beings and we lead who we are. So looking after ourselves, we, as, as, as people tell us all the time, the most important resource in a school is the teachers. And so who we are and how we look after our own self and as Daniela and Amy have both said, take ownership for our own well-being in a really challenging climate where we've got stuff being thrown at us um, every day 
um, and also a really uncertain environment. I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever had two days in school that are the same um, because in a way you might have great plans when you come to work for the day, but mostly something comes along and something will come out of their field that you need to respond to. So that uncertainty and that ability to pivot and um, and be flexible and respond in a way that you're able to manage your own state in all of that and uh, do your job in a way that you feel really proud of. Um, I'm very, very passionate about looking after our biggest resource, um, our teachers, and particularly I am very interested in looking after our leaders uh, because what I see is our leaders doing some extraordinary work about looking after teachers and I see our teachers doing extraordinary work about looking after our students. Um, but it's only pretty recently that principals and school leaders have come into that uh, narrative. Um, so they're a really critical part of the picture. So that's that's me. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, good evening, everyone. I echo um, my colleagues. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Woolison, I'm the Director of Staffing and Administration at Brigidine College at Randwick, um, and I'm lucky to be working in the same system as Leanne, and Leanne is a wonderful resource uh, for us oh, across the system. But I also, I'd like to talk a little bit about my, about my role, and, and whilst in my role I, um, I do have a lot of courage for the operational um, requirements of, of the school in which I work, a lot of my role does focus on working with our teachers, particularly um, in the coaching, the mentoring and the professional growth space. And so I'm really privileged to do a lot of work with teachers around how they are experiencing their day to day. I also have the absolute privilege of being there for, for my staff where things are going really well and celebrating that, but also being one of those first ports of call when things aren't going very well um, and being one of those people to whom um, they rely on some guidance or the opportunity to have a chat or the occasional shoulder on which to cry. And all of those are really humbling experiences. And I've noticed that over the last number of years that the, um, the extent to which teachers are needing support, be it professional, but also emotional uh, within the workplace is increasing. Um, and Leanne made a, a very astute point just a moment ago about the changing nature of recognising our leaders. And Leanne's focus, as she said, was around looking at the leadership wellbeing. And, and I look at my end, particularly around our younger teachers, our first year, our second and third year out, our provisional and pre-accredited teachers um, who are struggling in a way in their transition from their pre-service uh, experience into the classroom. And so one of my big areas of interest is, well, how can our mentoring practices and our leadership programs within schools actually support our teachers? Um, and one of my biggest mantras is professional wellbeing and personal wellbeing are fundamentally interconnected. Um, we often hear the word vocation spoken about with teaching. We hear it referred to as a profession and it is all of the above because fundamentally there is an altruistic um, calling to which all persons who work in schools have responded. And there's often a very distinct inability to separate the person from the work when you are a teacher, because fundamentally it is about giving. And so unlike other professions, professional wellbeing and personal wellbeing are so thoroughly interconnected. So my biggest area of interest is how can we maintain and work with our professional wellbeing within the walls of our school to support our personal wellbeing? And how can teachers be empowered to take charge of that and draw on the supports within school? So I look forward to the open discussion this evening. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing your journeys with us. Um, so our first question uh, for all panellists, um, and in thinking about the challenges and importance of teacher wellbeing, uh, could you please share with us what the current literature says about, about this, about the importance and challenges of teacher wellbeing? Sure. I will jump in there if that's okay. Um, if, if you speak to any educator and um, and as Amy and we, we all know us uh, ourselves when we survey staff, when, when we do a lot of different surveys, um, so the research globally and then also, also all the surveys that I've conducted with all the schools that I've worked with over the last few years, there are two key things that come up when we talk about 
what's happening for educators at the moment. And while there's there's probably about 20 things, but there's two thing reoccurring themes that come up all the time. And the first one is workload, 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 workload. So the workload is intense, it's increasing, the levels of accountability are increasing. But the second one is we don't feel valued and appreciated. And um, that's a, a space that I spend a lot of my work in was how do I value myself? How do I value others? And what does it mean to be valued? And also when we do look at the literature, there's a difference between recognition and appreciation. And so a big part of the work that I do with educators and leaders in schools is helping to shift that narrative about what do we want as opposed to what we don't want. Because we're exceptional at having conversations about exhaustion, um, stress, overwhelm, workload, not feeling valued, seen, heard or appreciated. But we're not very good at being proactive and having conversations about what we do want. So um, I hope that sort of gives a, a very simple snapshot to a very complex situation. But I'm conscious of time and um, I might hand over to Amy to, to, to expand on that. Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Um, I can definitely add to that. It, I think that piece you said about it being so complex with so many different areas is is the key to acknowledge. And many, I know many people that I talk to and those of you who have joined us this evening, you may think, oh, I hope I get something I can take away to do to my school with my school. And we hope that you get that. But the honest answer is every school is different and every school is so unique. And so when we're looking at literature, when we're looking at what we know about staff wellbeing, teacher wellbeing, there are pieces of research that show us and that highlight the more we do focus on educator well-being, the better it ripples into our classrooms for students. So we know that there is a direct link and a direct impact. What we haven't quite got enough research on in the education space is what exactly do we need to do in schools to support teacher well-being for that purpose? And so we have to look more widely than that. We have to be open to being a little bit more um, outside of the box in terms of some of those strategies. And this is where we do really need to lean on positive psychology research, um, where we need to lean on what might be happening in corporate spaces in terms of how we work, because there are certain um, areas, for example, around workplaces that have high levels of staff well-being, not necessarily in schools, but where it says things like, you know, where staff feel they're productive and they're able to do their job. So they've got good chunks of time to do deep work without interruptions, well-being is higher, where they're engaged in the work that they do. So they know what they're doing. It has a clear purpose. Uh, they're, they're working to their strengths. These things are really important in schools where well-being is high, along with an element of knowing what a standard of excellence is, what great performance looks like. Um, and what that really means is I know when enough is enough. I know when to stop. I know when I can say, you know what, I've done a great job today. I can be really proud of what I've done and I can go home and let it go. And we know that in our profession, there's always something to do. And so we've got to start looking at some of these key pieces that sit in other organisations and workplaces and say, okay, so if we know that those things really do support staff wellbeing across the board, how do we translate that into a specific education setting for us? And that opens up a whole range of conversations and discussions. And I certainly know in the schools that I work with, every school is different. Every school has a, a different way of working, you know, different numbers of staff, different timetables, different number of students, um, teachers teach different subjects, non-contact time is organised differently, assessments are different, assessment cycles are different, reporting is different. So because of this nuance, nuanced space that each school has and has autonomy over, it also does allow us to have autonomy over some of the strategies and changes we implement it, through that contextualised space. So the literature says, literature says lots it's our job to be really discerning about what do we need to take and apply as a whole in regards to education and teacher wellbeing, and then what do we take and apply into our setting? Thanks, Amy. Um, I'll, I'll pick up the button. Um, I think in terms of, I, I want to start with a bit of a definition of wellbeing because I'm, I'm really aware, I've just noticed there's 34 people um, in the webinar, and there's probably 34 pictures that we've got in each of our heads, uh, well, one picture in each of our 34 heads about what we mean by well-being. So I just want to start off with a, a, a bit of a definition. So um, I'm going to use one from ACER, which is a sustained positive mood and attitude, resilience and satisfaction with yourself your relationships and your work experiences. So I might just say it again because there's, there's sort of three key points in it. It's a sustained 
positive mood and attitude, resilience and satisfaction with self relationship and work experiences. So, yeah, we have got, a, you know, in any one environment, it's going to be very different, as Amy um, very correctly pointed out. Um, but it's about how do we sustain a positive mood and, and a seriously, like a um, an authentic positive mood, not a fake one, not just putting on a smile because, you know, that's what you, uh, you're on the inside, you feel exactly the opposite. We know that's not good for us um, at all. So I think shared definitions are really, really important. And in a way, it's a shared vision. Whether you agree or don't agree with that definition, it's probably not the most important thing. What is really important is that in your work setting, in your school, there is a shared understanding of what well-being is, what you're aiming towards. Because if you don't know what it is, that you're aiming towards, you won't know whether you've got it or whether you've not got it. So at the moment, um, or whether even if you want to improve it, if you don't actually have a vision for what, and I'm not talking about your school vision, um, because I'm very aware that I would say just about all schools have a school vision, but what is your shared vision for staff wellbeing? What is she shared? How are you going to know when you get there? And what is it that you can all agree on? And that requires a conversation. Um, it doesn't require somebody standing up on the first day and saying, well, at our school, this is how we define staff wellbeing. Um, and you're sitting there going, well, I don't agree with that because you've got to be able to engage with that um, and relate to it. So I wanted to start off with that. But I do want to touch also on values in there because um, in terms of understanding and knowing what, uh, you know, I, I, I think both Amy and Danielle said, you know, we're in this world where, you know, you can't go and buy a book. We can look up on the internet and get all the research that we want and all the strategies that we want. Um, but but actually, we as because all of our schools are different and our contexts are different, they're all driven by an enactment of values that is slightly different in every setting. So you might have resilience, for example, in one setting, and you might say, we'd like our staff to be resilient. You know, that might be part of it and go, okay, well, what does that look like? Because what it looks like in one school might be different to what it looks like. And then putting in the structures, of the leadership structures and the processes then that draw from your values and that operationalise those values um, we know that that is when we can bring about sustained change, when we start with the values, our own personal values for our personal wellbeing, and we, we you know, not just, but we really unpack what it means because, you know, they're going to mean slightly different things to people, but also come to what I call a, um, uh, it's a bit of a clunky term, but an institutionalised, like a, a, a what, how do you bear witness to that value of resilience with your staff as a school and what are the structures and processes. So that institutional witnessing of that value in action. These are challenges, but this is the sort of thing that the research is telling us. Thanks, Leanne. Um, and I think in, in, we, in, in looking at the literature and the way in which uh, we see the idea of teacher wellbeing being manifest or represented, it really, I think, is a contested space that's mixed in with a lot of competing interests in a school. Um, and I agree with my colleagues in the idea that obviously every school is contextual, every bunch of students is different, every group of staff is different, and every staff needs are going to be different from place to place, be it primary or secondary, so forth, or from different school to school. Um, but the reality is we do have a lot of competing needs. We have obviously our financial needs of a school where we need to have X number of teachers in front of X number of classes teaching Y number of hours to satisfy any number of enterprise agreements and hours and so forth so that we can actually provide our, our, our teaching and learning to our students. But we then also have what the literature is telling us about positive wellbeing, about the idea of balance in professional life about the idea of giving teachers that professional time. And to my mind, there is a distinct disconnect, obviously, between the literature that is best practice for teacher wellbeing. Um, and then we look at governmental policy that influences the ways in which schools 
uh, run and are affected by said policy. And we kind of see this bit of tug of war where teachers, leaders and systems are kind of caught in that nexus between what is best practice in trying to do the best for their staff, but then also having to respond to the ever-growing needs of legislative priorities, but also, if we can be honest, the you know, parent and social expectations of what school is and isn't and what school and teachers should or should not be doing. Um, and I think then we come back into, I think, um, Amy, you touched on this, that idea of perception um, and that idea of being appreciated. I think as well the, the notion of how teaching is perceived within the social dynamic is a real key element of teacher wellbeing. Because for many teachers, they seem to be occupying that parental space more and more and more, Um, not only establishing that moral guide for their students, not only providing that discipline and structure within the school environment, but also then supporting and advising parents on how best to develop and grow their child. And so we start to see teachers doing all of the things, doing all manner of, of tasks, not just teaching, not just having time to plan, but also sharing in that sort of parental growth and development of the child. Um, And we start to see these ever increasing expectations from our parents, our caregivers, but also from society. And I think all of that compounds onto the understanding of what is precisely the teacher. And then we see a lot of teachers trying to define precisely what that looks like in their own professional lives. And that is a very daunting task because it actually starts to then exude out of the professional workday into all other facets of life. And then we see what we see with our young teachers, that real early career burnout, that sense of overwhelm, that sense of uh, lack of preparedness or feelings of preparedness from making that transition from pre-service to practicing teacher. So I think we're caught in a dichotomy at the moment of competing interests where schools need to be all manner of things and teachers need to do all manner of things but I think we've lost sight of the person in the middle, which is the teacher and the school. Great, right, thank I'm so, you. Sorry, can I just jump on that, if that's okay, Megan? Megan, um, what I love that you've mentioned there, Matthew, is the humanness, and we forgot the human. And mm. one of the key things that I talk about um, with educators, and the reason I say educators, because we're talking about teaching staff and non-teaching mm, staff, absolutely. it's the same ecosystem, is um, we we we. we I ask people to think about the fact that we're a human being, not a human doing. Mm -hmm. And it's called well-being, not well-doing. And we are so task-focused in education and we forget that we are a human and we treat ourselves as machines. And what I love about what you said there, Leanne, is we all have different messages or different ideas about what well-being means. And there is no one global definition of well-being or educator well-being. And, Mm -hmm. in fact, if we want to make it even more simple of what does um, well-being mean, the simplest definition I love is feeling good and functioning well. Mm. But then there's the question, do I need to feel good all the time and do I need to have a positive mindset all the time? And I would argue I don't have to have a positive mindset all the time, but I do need to have an awareness of my emotional state and I need to have the social and emotional skills to manage my emotional state. Mm. I'm allowed to be exhausted. I'm allowed to be tired because the reality is It is dynamic and it is tough, but I have to own that and have strategies in place to manage that and not blame my colleagues or blame the parents or blame the systems in that space. So one of the simplest ways I like to explain well-being, and frankly, I encourage people to take the word well-being and chuck it in the bin because it doesn't actually mean anything. It's an abstract construct. Um, And I I prefer to use the word energy because effectively what we're talking about when it comes to educator well-being is I'm talking about my cognitive energy and the fact that I suffer from cognitive fatigue, my emotional energy because I'm caring about every human in front of me, um, parents, colleagues and, and young people, and then the social energy of having to manage the social dynamics of different personalities all the time. So when someone comes to you and says, what are you going to do for my well-being, what they're secretly saying is what are you going to do for my energy? And the reality is we can't do energy for people. We can influence it, we can impact it, but we can't actually do it for us. So the first thing is energy, not well-being. And the second part to touch on what everybody has said here as well is having that conversation to contextualize. Is it a me issue? Is it my personal energy because I didn't get enough sleep last night or I've got other things happening in my life? 
Is it a we issue because it's a relationship that's lifting me up or pulling me down, a parent, a colleague who perhaps is a roadblock or the system is over overwhelming me or I've got a wonderful mentor and coach that I rely on and inspires me. So those relationships is the we context. And then there's the us context. Is it a system issue? Is it a compliance issue? Is it because I don't, I'm not clear on my role and expectations? Is it because there is no role clarity? Is it because I'm expected to be at work till 10 o'clock three times, three nights in a row, which is just not sustainable? And how are we addressing the psychosocial hazards that we put in front of educators from a systemic perspective as well? So when we have a language such as energy, not well-being, human being, not human doing, in the context of me, we and us, I think we can really start to shift the narrative and better understand what does it mean to be well at work? When am I allowed to be a human being? What skills do I need to manage myself in a difficult context, given it's an ecological model that we're pretty much working in? And what can I do as leaders and um, as leaders of an organisation to better support individuals, um, uh, teams, and then um, systemic things as well? I went on a bit of a rant, but I get excited. Sorry. Daniela, that's a really good point because I think it really focuses back onto the idea that we are human beings within the context of a microcosm that is forming human beings. 100%. So our product, as it were, if we we take the sort of corporate sort of definition, our product is not, um, you know, necessarily a commodity. It's the cultivation and formation of persons. Um, and regardless of whether this is from a, you're working in a religious school or you're working in a government school, or you're working in a school that does not have a religious framework, notwithstanding one of the purposes, the social purpose of education is to form, um, you know, well-rounded citizens. Oh. And so we are as human beings, as teachers and as educators, needing to focus on that sense of well-being in that me, we and us model that you you mentioned there, Daniela. Because if we are not well, our students and our learners can't possibly be well. And if our leaders are not well, our staff can't be well either. So yeah. there, there are a number of ripples that I think we've picked up on here that have really stimulated um, setting the tone for this discussion. Sorry, can I just add one more thing and I'll be very quick. I agree with um, all of that, but I just want to throw out a little bit of a a provocation. Um, And in as much as, you know, when we talk about well-being, it's a a thing, it's a noun, um, it's static, it's there. Um, And so, and, and, and a lot of the conversation has been around that. So Daniela's point about, you know, we're not uh, we're not human doings, we're human beings. However, we are human beings that need to do something. What we need to do is we need to do well-being. Um, <laughs> so that's the part of it. We're able to be mm. as human beings, but we also have to do um, to do well-being, whatever that means. And I think that's, you know, Amy touched on some strategies and I know that's coming up later in the webinar and it's about what it is that you're going to do, that that we do, and that's going to be slightly different, of course. But, you know, we do all of that so that we can have well-being, so that we can have it. So it's sort of it's that be, that being, um, and Matt's talked about that and really importantly, the person, and we're in the business of forming other little people. Um, you know, we also need some really good modelling around that and some unpacking that well-being isn't just a static, even in that definition that I gave, it's a very static definition. So if it's about doing and it's about doing well-being, um, you know, and, and sometimes that doing well-being might actually be doing very little. Um, it doesn't mean that it's yet another job that we've got to add to ourselves. Um, so it's, yeah, so I, th- I think everybody appreciates that. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you all. Some wonderful discussion there. Um, and let's yeah keep unpacking that. Um, so a question now specifically for Amy and Daniela. Um, how can teachers take charge of their own professional well-being and what are some key strategies? Absolutely. Um, there are so many different things we can do. And again, I like to break them down into the, the me, we and us. Um, but if, again, if we're looking at, we need to map everything to research again. Um, and one of the areas that I love to work in is this concept of Thrive. And in fact, you know, got the, the little book of, of Thrive that I um, proudly published only a few months ago. And Thrive is an acronym. And the reason I'm sharing that, because 
it's one thing to have a conversation and one thing to draw on the research, but I, as an educator myself, like, just tell me what I need to do. Give me something to walk away with. And I think that's important as well. And so one of the, a, a, a particular strategy we always focus on and the currency we use in education, we don't use money to buy and sell stuff. We use time. And one of the things that I talk about, so T in Thrive stands for time. Um, what's my narrative around time? How do I manage time? How do I schedule time? And in fact, if you want to take away one thing from today, my message to you would be manage your energy, not your time. We are already time focused. So we need to manage our energy and time. Um, and the next one is head. How am I managing my own thoughts, my, uh, my thinking traps, my perfectionism, my performing, my pleasing, my wanting to be right, um, wanting to and staying up to one o'clock in the morning to make sure all my fonts are the right size when no one cares, it's not important. Staying up till midnight to find the right picture for my PowerPoint. Again, no one cares. We're putting all this pressure on ourselves, laminating everything in sight, color coding our folders so I feel better at night. So what are the things we're doing to ourselves in our head? Then, of course, there's the R, which is relationships. Who are your greatest supporters? I, which is the impact. Noticing the phenomenal work and the phenomenal impact that we have every day. And again, if we look at definitions in well-being, the feel good is hedonic well-being, chasing, I want to feel good, seeking pleasure. And then eudaimonic well-being uh, from Aristotle, which is I want to be of service to others. So when I speak to educators and I say it's week eight, nine, ten, and, and they say I'm so tired, and I say why are you tired? And they say, oh, you know, and I say, no, explain to me. I say, tell me one thing you're proud of achieving today. And typically educators will say, I'm proud of so-and-so in year five or so-and-so in year eight. And I say, no, 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 what are you proud of you? And we find it very hard to say, what am I proud of? And I say, if you've been so busy, what have you been busy doing? And we miss a massive opportunity to celebrate the time and energy that we put into other people's children. And it's a wonderful thing that we need to really ask ourselves at the end of every day. And then, of course, the V is values, what's important to me, and the E is how do I manage my emotional um, spectrum of, uh, of feelings, um, recognising that there's a, there's a roller coaster that happens because the reality of a teaching day is if, if you go home feeling like the world has emotionally vomited on you, it has. So how do you switch off? How do you put that stuff to the side so you don't lie there at night in bed thinking about all the things you have to do and then waking up at three o'clock in the morning with your to-do list. How do, you, how do you do that? And the reason I chose the concept Thrive, and this comes from um, uh, um, uh, Gretchen Spitzer's work in organisational psychology, and she says that in order for us to thrive at work, we need two components. The first component is energy, which is what I'm always talking about, energy, not well-being. Um, so where's the energy? And then the second component is a learning and growing component. But she says, if you have high energy and low learning or low growing, you will be bored. If you have high learning because you're new to a school or there's massive change and you have low energy, you burn out. You need a balance of both. We need to learn and grow, but then we need to do so in a way that is energizing for ourselves and it's different for everybody. A beginning teacher will say, energize for me, having energy at work is being organized because um, everything's so complicated. I want to achieve my outcomes. Someone who's been teaching for maybe 10 years or so will say, actually, you know what? Well-being at work for me is having work-life balance because my life at home is crazier than it is at work. And someone perhaps who's been teaching for 25, 30 years says, you know what? I just want to see the kids smile because I don't care about all the other stuff anymore. I've got the skills to manage that space. So when we have a better conversation about what it means to thrive, energy and learning and growing, coupled with specific strategies on how to manage the stuff that we have to do in the reality of the job, then we're better placed to actually feel well and function better at work. I'll hand over to you, Amy. What do you reckon? I mean, you've covered so much. Um, oh, come on. It. You've got heaps of stuff. I love your work. <laughs> um, I'm going to take a bit of a different spin because I think you've provided so many practical strategies in there. And if you've listened and are like, I, I couldn't take all of those notes, just read Daniela's book. It's all in there. Um, so I get that. But I want to 
I think the first thing I want to highlight when we think about strategies is don't wait for someone else to do well-being for you. Don't outsource it. Don't think, oh, well, there's nothing I can do because of the system and there's nothing I can do because there's so much going on at work. We need to take some of that autonomy back within ourselves. There are multiple things we can do. Uh, And I have a podcast, I interview heaps of people on it, and I always ask them, you know, what's the one thing you wish you knew when you were younger or what's the one thing that you think everyone should do for well-being? Unanimously, the answer is always sleep. And I know we hear it a lot and I know we think, oh, yeah, sleep. But it actually is the most powerful thing that you can do. And what we know about sleep is if you haven't had enough sleep, then your perception of stress is going to be higher. If you haven't had enough sleep, your ability to engage in healthy resilience strategies isn't going to be there. So stress, so sleep impacts so many things. And I know we hear it a lot, but I always think it's good to to remind us of that and know how much sleep you need and give yourself permission to do that. I also want to come back to this idea of really knowing what well-being is for you. You kind of can't design strategies if you don't know what it is that you want. And so what we tend to have happen if we don't know what well-being is to us is we do this copy and comparison. So we copy what the educator is doing next door. We copy what our siblings are doing. We copy someone we see on Instagram and we think, oh, like they seem to have it all together and they run marathons. So I need to run marathons too. No, you don't. You need to do what works for you. So if you are someone who thinks my well-being is never going to be great because I don't like yoga and meditation, it's okay. You don't have to do those things. It's about finding what works for you. And the only way to do that is, ex- is experiment. So I often talk about well-being as being an experiment because all we're ever doing is trying things and thinking, does this work? Does it not? It worked yesterday and now I'm getting nothing from it. So you've got to give yourself permission to play with different tools and strategies and build a really healthy toolkit know what to draw upon when, but also give yourself some um, compassion if it just doesn't work out. We've had lots of conversation around the humanness of us and we're all human. There are days where I I just don't function well. I just think, you know what? I know all of the stuff, but today none of it's working for me and it's okay because it's just a moment. It's just a season. It's just, it's not the forever space. We don't have to live here. So we've got to be able to know some things work sometimes and sometimes they're just not going to. And that's really being comfortable with stepping into how you want to feel. And so my next piece is pay attention to that. Pay attention to how you feel and know that when there are these moments of stress or overwhelm or exhaustion, and you know, the best way I think to be able to identify these is pay attention to conversations because when we're in this space, we love to get together and have a little bit of a, oh, my day was so hard and someone will say, yes, yeah, so was mine. And we shouldn't disregard this. I think this is possibly some of the most valuable data. And if you're a leader listening, those moments in the staff room when staff are sharing these things are actually really useful to listen to because that's their real life. Like that's what they're saying. And so those little fleeting comments that we might think are nothing are are probably something we want to pay attention to. Um, Is more than one person saying this or am I saying this multiple times? Because if you're one of my great mentors says the first time is chance, the second time is coincidence, and the third time is a pattern of behavior. And so once something happens three times, we kind of want to pay attention to that because that's some really useful data. So pay attention to how you feel, pay attention to your conversations, and become really curious about, actually, is this a message I need to listen to here? Is there something going on? Extend compassion to that, you know, because we're all human, we all have moments, but then ask, am I okay with this? Like, do I want to stay here? Or can I actually do something different to change it? And you might know what to do or you might not. And this is where we've got to start to have some discernment about what we what we use and implement, but also take some action. Right now, we are in the middle of a really great place of self-development and self-help, and we are inundated with information. There are podcasts, there are books, there are articles. And this is where individually we can start to learn, listen to a podcast, read a book, um, Google something. There are so many strategies out there that we can utilize. And so we have to take a little bit of action and autonomy around what that looks like for ourselves. And the last piece is coming back to, is this in my control or not? Like, is this thing that I'm fixated on or is this piece that is impacting my well-being in my control or not? So can I actually control the fact that right now we're in a staffing shortage and there are things that are impacting what might be happening in my, in my school? We can't control that. That's the reality globally. But what we can control are perhaps some of the structures in our school that might be impacting that or how we prepare ourselves when we show up for what might be happening in our day. Can we control the fact that we're tired and haven't had enough sleep? 
if you've got a young child, you probably can't. But if you if you don't and you can sleep, yeah, you can. And so this is where some self-parenting comes in and we've got to turn the TV off and we've got to go to bed. Uh, so play around with the idea of can I actually control this? And this doesn't mean that you want to. There is a difference between I can do it and do I want to do it? Am I going to do it? And so be really honest with yourself because I know sometimes I'm I'm telling myself I should go to bed, but I'm just hitting play on that next episode. So we've got to have a little bit of self-responsibility and self-leadership in this well-being area too. It doesn't all sit within what happens at work. Um, it really is around the permission we give ourselves to try different things, whether that is at home, whether that is in the workspace, whether it's around, you know, how we organize our time, how we look at our to-do list. I used to do this great thing um, that came out of my own chronic stress with a colleague and leader of mine. I would take my to-do list because everything was important to me. Everything was 100% important. I had to do it. And I couldn't decide whether or not I could let something go. I couldn't decide whether or not something was out of my control and I didn't need to be up to, as Daniela said, 1am deciding on what picture to put in and, you know, what font should I use? And so I used to take my to-do list to a colleague and leader and we would go through it together and they would say, you know what, you absolutely need to do this because this is important and this is part of your job. If you have time and you have energy and you have capacity, go and do these things and see these I don't even know why that's on your list. You're clearly just making up stuff to keep yourself busy, go and get a hobby. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we used to do when I really needed someone to, to guide me with that. So that's a strategy you can try with your colleagues or with a leader as well, because sometimes we need someone else to tell us like, hey, you don't actually need to sharpen your colored pencils and then organize them by color every afternoon. That is a waste of time. That's, that, that's me. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you both for those uh, wonderful contributions um, regarding how teachers can take control of their own well-being. Um, I'd now like to invite Leanne and Matthew to share with us uh, how effective coaching and mentoring relationships can enhance teacher well-being. Okay, well, uh, Matthew, you okay if I just start off? Go for it. Okay, so I'm going to start off again with a bit of a definition just so that you know what's in my head about when, when I say coach and you know what's in my head when I talk about mentoring. Um, it's probably not important whether or not you agree or you disagree. I'm just sort of sharing it so that you know when I start to go on about something, you know the context that I'm coming from. So I think if I was to talk about a mentor, I think everybody needs both a coach and a mentor, two different people, two different roles. Um, I think when they are the same person, if, like in an ideal world, obviously, in an ideal world, um, in a, the reason being is that they are two very, very distinct roles. So if it is embodied in one person, that person needs to be very clear about when they are um, giving advice or when they are working in that coach space. So a mentor, we, I'm sure that a lot of you have heard the guide on the side or the sage on the stage. Um, that's actually what your mentor does. Your mentor does exactly what Amy just talked about, that you take your to-do list and you say, help me through this because I'm overwhelmed. They are generally somebody who is more experienced than you are um, in that space. I noticed that uh, somewhere along uh, in one of the comments, somebody talked about being mentored about somebody who was one step ahead of you. It's really important that that person brings some experience and some expertise uh, in, in that role. So you can go to them with every single question and you can expect that to be answered um, with your mentor. Um, you can also expect that if you've had a bad day, you can go and, you know, tell them about it and they will... Uh, hold space for you with empathy and um, hopefully say things to you um, to give you some direction about today was just a bad day, you know, go home, have a good night's sleep, start again tomorrow. Um, you know, we can start over. A coach is a really, really different thing because what a coach is doing is actually working with you to unpack those resources. Daniela's talked a lot about those resources Every single one of us are already complete and capable human beings. Even when we're not feeling like that, <laughs> um, we might not be feeling very complete and capable. We might be feeling quite um, uh, the opposite. So you already have these resources inside of you. And one of them might be going by Daniela's book. Hop onto Amy's website, 
their resources that you have got inside of you, plus lots of other ones, and different people are going to have different ones. We all need access to those resources, and a coach will help you uncover those resources yourself. Now, the good thing about that is when you leave, you think you've probably done it yourself, and you become, you do that growing that uh, Daniela talked about. You, you, you have that. You bring that energy to that space to grow and get that balance. So, um, yeah, so that just to create those two definitions between coaching and mentoring, what can a coach do for you in that space? If you are feeling, um, they can help you unpack. We talked about your values. Um, they can help you unpack. What is it that you really want? What does it look like? What is it your perfect life look like? Or, you, you know, what's it going to look like when you're, You've got work-life balance or or you're healthy and you're um, not stressed. Uh, they're going to help you unpack those. Um, and, and, and what does that look like? And what are the behaviours that, that go along with that? They're going to help you create a plan of action and they're going to actually hold you to account for, for doing that action. They're not going to do it for you. Your mentor might. Your mentor might say, oh, listen, Give that one to me, I might be able to get somebody else to do that. But your coach won't do that. Your coach will hold you to account, but in a good way. It's This is about your growth. Um, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be doing their job. So it's about empowering you to be to do that self-leadership, to have that self-compassion that Amy talked about. So um, how can how can they that's how they can help in that space? And you know, I seriously believe that everybody. Um, in our schools needs both a mentor and a coach no matter what or at least access to them whether you choose to take that up or not is is potentially your own choice but our beginning teachers our early career teachers um, I think that role of mentor slash coach gets very very blurred um, and and our beginning leaders or our middle leaders Daniela talked about you know it gets really blurred because um, you know, there's all sorts of things, but actually separating them and pointing people in those directions, they're two very different relationships and they help create community. So. Thanks, Leanne. And I think I, I just want to come back to this shared language that I think we've all been using tonight. And I'm going to draw, Daniela, on your um, notion that you mentioned before about the tension that exists between energy and learning and growth. And I would argue from, from my experience of observing, you know, young teachers, but also teachers across all levels of experience, that those notions of learning and growth and energy seem to ebb and flow across whether it's a year, a term, a week, sometimes it can be a day, depending on what's coming at you. But, and as Daniela said, holding those notions of energy as well-being and learning and growth in some kind of balance is absolutely instrumental. And this is where I look at, um, you know, the idea of coaching as being a really effective tool. Now, I love the metaphor of coaching in education as being kind of like you as the coach are on the sidelines watching your player on the basketball court or on the soccer field. And you're the one who is, you know, showing them where they need to go, watching their blind spot, watching their back, uh, giving them that insight into what they may have missed. And I think oftentimes we see teacher energy depleting because so often in the very complex nature that is schooling in the 21st century, we have our eyes on so many things at the same time, whether or not it is, yes, it's compliance. Yes. It's teaching and learning. It's professional learning. It's developing my professional growth goals for the year. Um, it's, you know, keeping an eye on my maintenance. It's all of these multiple competing factors that I think are taking time and taking our eyes off the central importance of our roles, which is cultivating our young people for the future. And so this is where I see effective mentoring practices. And I can speak particularly to the development of some of the early career work that I've done in my context, where about dedicating time to work with our young teachers so that they can have open and free opportunities to discuss and candidly reflect upon the struggles that they are experiencing, but also the gratitude that they have and the and the successes that they are experiencing, and working one on one with an experienced colleague who can guide them through those tough moments, I've actually seen as a way of actually alleviating those very early elements of burnout. 
and we start to see, and, and the literature will tell us when we have these very effective programs, that's when we start to see teacher retention because teachers know that someone has their back, someone's looking out for them. And that's where I see the real value of mentoring and coaching. I know Leanne very artfully spoke about the difference between them, but when they work well together, we actually have teachers who feel not only that they're appreciated, but that they're seen, but also that someone is actually supporting them and that someone had, that this teacher has someone that they can go to, to ask those pertinent questions. And I often see coming back to Daniela's point, that notion of teacher energy deplete when support systems aren't in place um, and when the expectations are rising, but the support is not rising to meet them. And I think if we speak about our students, we often talk about having high expectations for our students. And it's essential that we have high expectations for our staff. But when we talk about high expectations for students, it's always in the context of high support. So therefore, anything that we are delivering for our students that expects them to perform at their best, we have to mirror that pedagogically with our staff. And so not only do we need to be providing these frameworks and these supports through coaching and mentoring opportunities, where teachers can feel as though they've got someone to speak to, someone that they can run ideas by, someone that they can actually have coaching them from the sidelines, whether it's observing a lesson, whether it's saying that went really well, but did you think about doing it this way? Having those open conversations, I think, is the key to in the day-to-day, -day, in the workplace environment, taking some of that cognitive load off teachers' shoulders and giving them the opportunity to see the blind spots um, and oftentimes it is the blind spots that become the most perilous for teachers in their feelings of burnout. Um, sorry, I also just wanted to add on to um, that. Thanks thanks for that, Matthew. I, I also just wanted to, that conversation that we were having, um, I, I also love the concept of energy, Daniela. I thought that was a, a, a really, uh, it's got a lot more movement in it to me, you know, like good, like a lot or a little depending on where you're at. But it's 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 a more active term, I think. So thank you for sharing that with um, us today. But I want to go back to something that you probably I don't know about you, but forty three years ago I did it in my first year at Teachers College, um, and we talk about it in the context of our students. But I'm going to talk about it in the context of you, as uh, you as educators, and that are what are our core needs. And so there's a slightly different. Um, uh, so it, it's a, a Maybe it's different, maybe it's just a different way of saying it. But we look at, it, it, not necessarily Maslow, who that's who I learned about, but, you know, there's some other ways of articulating that. So along three different continuums and the energy that you, you have and you need along those. So, you know, we all have a need for certainty and that's what our structures and processes give us in our schools. So that's what those things that um, somebody's talked about having a handbook. Um, uh, you know, that, that's going to point out what the things that are there, the structures and the processes, having conversations, whether people get appointed leaders or mentors, whatever it is, whether it's time. But the structures and processes give us uh, a certainty around that. But at the, if we have too much certainty, I think it was Danielle, you talk, uh, Amy, you talked about getting bored. Like, I don't know, sometimes the school day is, you know, as, as very variety as it is, that rhythm of the school year, I know I've had to step out of sometimes thinking if I have another smile at those kindergarten children on the first day of school, I, like, I, I, like I couldn't do it with authenticity because that rhythm of the, the school is so repetitive and, and ongoing. So... For me, so that it's also important to have some adventure and variety. But on any one day, where does our need sit along that continuum um, or at any one time in our life or et cetera? But, so that's really important in terms of our wellbeing. In terms of we all need to feel significant, and we talk, and Daniela talked about um, uh, appreciation and recognition. Uh, we all need to be seen. We all need to know that we exist and that people can see who we are. Um, as, as professionals, every single one of us. Um, and we need to have as well as that. We also need to feel like we belong as big, as part of a bigger group. And on any one day, we might just want to lock ourselves in the classroom. We might not want to be team teaching um, or collaborate, collaboratively planning or whatever it is. Um, and the third continuum, those two continuums have to be in place first. Those are our really basic ones. So in terms of when we're talking about well-being and energy, 
understanding where you sit on those continuums on any one day. Some of the stuff that causes us to feel unsettled is because we're, we can't find our place along that continuum or we've got too much change or too much certainty. But the third one is the one that is, um, Matt t uh, touched on it and I think Danielle did too, and it's about the continuum of growth and contribution. So, you know, we're born to not stay the same. We're born to learn. We talk about, you know, love, we're all lifelong learners, blah, 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 blah. We've all heard those big terms. But actually that's how we are hardwired as human beings. We are hardwired not to stay the same but to grow and improve. And at the end of that other continuum is our, our, um, our core need to contribute to something. So in Japan, they talk about that as ikagi, and um, I should have actually brought it with me, but it's where all of those core needs all combine. And I'm not even going to try and say that guy's name, uh, the psychologist who talks about well-being, that when we are, have got the right balance on that continuum, we're working on inflow, and that gives us our energy. Because when you're in flow, you can be in flow, and it doesn't, you know, the time just slips by. Uh, without you even noticing it. So it's actually very energy giving. So I think going back to those core needs is a really important part of um, where that coaching and mentoring sits because if you have a need for certainty, you don't want a coach asking you powerful questions about, well, what do you think you can do about that? You know, um, how might you go about problem solving? Okay. Now that's great. Or, you know, what I think I hear you saying is you want a mentor saying, this is going, just do this if you need to have certainty. Um, and that's going to be different at different stages in your, your career or whatever. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for an insightful um, discussion and conversation. Um, I would love this to keep going, to be very honest. Um, it's actually such a timely um, moment for us to have this topic. So thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the Teachers Guild of New South Wales Council, um, I would really like to thank our distinguished panel this evening, Daniela Filecki, Amy Green, Matthew Williston, Leanne Nicol, and Megan Bennett for their time and dedication in engaging us on, on a very informative discussion in the opportunities and challenges on our topic today. The Teachers Guild of New South Wales thanks you for your friendship and congratulates you on the work you've been leading in making education the vibrant professional association that it is. So thank you so much. Uh, just in terms of follow-up, uh, the event recording will be sent out along with a certificate of attendance and a short post-survey to help us shape our future monthly online webinars. Thank you for joining our event and we look forward to seeing you at future Guild events. Please stay safe and well. Thank you.